Welcome, everybody. Are you as anxious as I am to hear from the amazing author and brewer, Michael Tonsmeyer? Well, we're going to get to hear about brewing light, small table beers. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm the host of the Gourmet Brewing Channel. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina in the USA, and I want to thank you all for taking time because we strive to make your day more delicious one sip at a time. So please share in this chat how the audio is. You know, I can't I can't really tell on my end. Uh, Michael was saying I needed to adjust it a little bit. So uh, let me know what how you think the audio sounds. Now, while I'm waiting on that, I want to uh, ask you to also share where you're viewing from. I would love to hear uh, where in the world you're viewing this event. I've already seen a couple of things in there, uh, I think I saw Germany, yeah, uh, Viola was in Germany, I think Steve in Anchorage, uh, audio, Viola says uh, Anchorage, uh, the audio is fine, even in Hamburg, Germany, so you're up late, Viola. Well, good, that's encouraging, so let, let me know if it, uh, if, if we're like uneven or anything like that, uh, up in Netherlands, hello, Gary, uh, if the audio's uneven when Mike comes on. Uh, so I want to bring on Mike because he really is here, and I'm going to try and get this right. I'm still not quite used to this interface, so if I screw that up, have some patience. Uh, now, consider writing in the chat to let Michael know how much you appreciate his volunteering his time with us today. He's given us already, or given me 30 minutes already, about 30 minutes before that, and maybe we can get him to hang on for the Zoom call afterwards in the after party, so... Hope you can join us then. So please vote in today's polls and help shape future programming. And let me tell you a little bit about Michael. Uh, Michael is a well-respected brewer and co-founder of Sapwood Cellar Brewery in Columbia, Maryland. And with his profound expertise in brewing, he earned the nickname the Mad Fermentist. I'll have to get a better story on the mad part. But anyway... For his innovative approach to fermentation and experimentation in craft beer. And in addition, he's also the author of the American Sour Beer's Innovative Techniques for Mixed Fermentations. That's a book that's highly regarded as a definitive guide in the realm of sour beer production. Michael shares his knowledge in his blog, The Mad for Menace, where he educates on various brewing techniques and fermentation processes and recipes. This work has cemented him as a cemented status. I'll try that again. His work has cemented his status as a key figure in the craft beer community. I, I really flubbed that up pretty good. But anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> Especially in the domain of sour and mixed fermentation. Now, Michael, I'm going to bump you off the screen for just a minute, and we will see you momentarily. Hopefully, I did that successfully. Now, if you're a first-time viewer, these are free monthly events with subject matter experts. To get on here, you've got a yeah, concrete thought. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Wish I could have gotten it out. Uh, this is our 95th first free live major event, thanks to monthly supporters via Patreon. And individuals who contribute uh, during the login process, you have the opportunity to kind of buy me a beer or get a tip. And I really appreciate cut that because that's that's what pays for all these platforms and, and all this crazy stuff that I do. I thank you for that, and I'm incredibly appreciative. Now, Gourmet Brewing is a totally community-funded channel and is supported by many of you that are there through the crowdfunding site Patreon. Supporters receive and then and get audio files behind the scenes, brewery tours, including exclusive full-length interviews, 
people like Ken Grossman and John Mallett, and and shortly we'll have something with with Michael here. And I just realized, again, I'm not used to this new format. Uh, I don't have a little button there for Patreon, so I'm going to put it there in the chat. I uh, don't mean to tie up all the chat with that stuff. So consider joining the team and support these events by clicking at the bottom center link, which is not there. <laughs> but anyway, I will fix that. Uh, I also have a very active YouTube channel, and thanks to many of you, lots of folks are getting on there, and my channel is really growing, and that is really important. Consider jumping on that YouTube channel and subscribing, because I've learned certain guests use that as their metric. So the more likes I've got on there with the videos, the more subscribers I've got, it will help me get great big guests like Michael. So if you are viewing this screen on YouTube or other social media, please consider joining the Crowdcast link. It should be there in the description. And there you can participate in the chat and you can ask questions. And then just quickly click the follow button in the upper right-hand corner to get notifications of new events. Uh, if you have any issues, refreshing the browser solves most technical issues, reducing the resolution, with the gear symbol can usually help also. <clears throat> and please share in the chat where you're from. Uh, if you got a LinkedIn profile, you want to share that, that's great. Put it in there. This is a great chance to build community. Please consider answering the poll. And also, whenever you register, click the auto registration. I can save you time. And many of you here probably benefited from the auto registration that you have. Also, I do virtual speaking virtual private tastings, and live events. Now, upcoming live stream, Dan Carey of New Glarus will be October 12th. Uh, for those of you with, or, that are AHA members, Laura Burns will be at the end of this month. Uh, and if you're not an AHA member, consider joining. Uh, I did some recent interviews with Tim Yarrington and Jeff Lavesh. Uh, also with the Brewers at Sierra Nevada and Charlie Bamsworth. I hadn't posted those on YouTube yet. Uh, I will be at GABF uh, judging in phase three. So let me know if you're going to be there and if you're going to be at the uh, festival, because I would love to look you up, get a selfie with you. That would be great fun. Uh, and we always have a Zoom after party. And I think if we don't wear out, Michael, he may actually spend a few minutes with us there. I'll put the link in. It obviously doesn't start until we move over, and I will put the link in later, so don't, don't worry about trying to find that link. Um, so I want to get Chris back on screen and quit yapping, and hopefully I will do it successfully, Chris, if I hit the right button. <laughs> well, I'm two for two, although uh, before we got started, it was a little rough. But anyway, thank you for joining us, and I have an initial question that I've been pondering. As I have researched this exciting webinar, I realized I didn't fully understand all the words associated with uh, lower ABV beers. So how would you contrast regular beer versus light and other aspects of lesser, <laughs> lesser beers, whether they be craft beers or whatever? How are they similar and how are they different? Sure. Uh, first, thanks for having me. Um, light beer was really something that grew out of diet beer. Uh, and diet beer was something that the big breweries really didn't think was selling well to their target demographic, mostly men. And so they came up with light beer and sort of the sales pitch became, you can drink more of it. Um, it's not a lighter flavor. It's just a little lower alcohol, a little bit lower calorie. Uh, but that's not a new invention. That's something that's been uh, part of the brewing scene for as long as there's been beer. There were always table beers, which just meant something that was really low alcohol that you could essentially drink all day long while you were working in the field um, because water wasn't potable and a one or two percent alcohol beer was something that was safe to drink. And that grew into things like session beer in England. Uh, it grew into just sort of the everyday drinking beers of Germany, Belgium, the Czech Republic that were often three, four, five percent alcohol. And those beers have all sort of turned into their own styles. You know, a Berliner Weiss isn't a light version of another style. It's just a low alcohol sour beer that is in and of itself uh, low alcohol, light, refreshing, 
And really that's sort of what we've seen come about in America as people want to drink beer. I mean, that's sort of the biggest issue for me. I want to drink more beer. Um, all things being equal, I'd rather drink two beers or three beers rather than one beer. And so if I can craft a beer that has as much flavor, the body, and all I'm sacrificing is the alcohol, I can have two 3% beers rather than one 6% beer. I can have a one 6% stout rather than having an imperial stout, uh, you know, a half an imperial stout. But that's really a challenge. Um, just by its very nature, um, you know, beer and malt and alcohol has a lot of, you know, intrinsic flavor. And you can't just pull out half of the carbohydrates and half of the alcohol and expect it to taste the same. Um, I know uh, Mike McDowell, who uh, isn't with us anymore, would always talk about making a light lager just by having seltzer water on tap in his kegerator. And if he wanted to make a light lager, he'd have a pour of his American, uh, you know, standard 5% lager and add one third seltzer water. And that would get him to a, a place he was happy with. But that really does make a lighter beer, both in flavor, in alcohol, in uh, body and mouthfeel. And that works for a light lager, but that might not work for making, say, an English mild or a uh, wit beer or another sort of intrinsically low alcohol style. But I, so Michael, what, what is the challenge then? What If you want a light IPA, you were talking about, you know, Charlie uh, Papazian was telling me about this, that he frustrated that. When he goes to a place, the majority of the taps are full strength IPAs and you can't have that many, just like you expressed. So if I want a light IPA or even a light pale ale, what's the biggest challenge to brewing that? Sure. There's no way to get around the fact that there's less alcohol. Alcohol itself is going to have a sweetness to it. It's a great solvent of aromatics. It is going to affect the mouthfeel. Um, and there's really nothing you can do to replace that alcohol. I, every once in a while, uh, a friend of mine will say, hey, you know, I got this fun, you know, non-alcoholic rum or something like that. And they'll often put in a little chili powder or something like that to give it the, the warmth that you'd expect from a spirit. Um, that kind of thing just really doesn't work with beer and honestly doesn't really work with non-alcoholic spirits. Um, so you just sort of have to take it for granted that you're not going to have that component of it. And then you have to work around that. So, for example, um, on the malt side, you really have to be cognizant of that you're using less malt. And so you want to build in extra malt flavor, extra dextrins, extra body um, using, you know, the, the water salts, using maybe yeast strain selection. Um, when it comes to hopping, it's really difficult to get the same oomph from half the amount of hops. So you might want to consider using Hops that are a little bit less bitter, so you can use the same amount of hops, or hops are higher in oil, or advanced hop products where you know it's uh, we use an extract at the brewery for some of our pale ales uh, from Hopsteiner called Salvo that is debittered. So it's something similar to like Incognito, but without the alpha acid. And so that's again a way that we can get in more hop compounds, more hop flavor, but without um, debalancing uh, the beer. You know, if we're taking away half the alcohol, we can't have 90 IBUs, we want to have that 45 IBUs, but in the same breath, we don't want to cut the hop aromatics in half or the um, hop flavor compounds in half. And we'll get into all that stuff as, as this goes on. But um, for a commercial brewer, it's a real challenge just because, uh, as Charlie Papazian pointed out, a lot of Americans um, you know, buy based on ABV. And uh, Doug was saying when we talked earlier that, it, and I'm sure he'll remember who it was, someone said Americans buy beer like they buy gasoline that, you know, people are looking for that 88 octane or that 90 octane, and that's what's, you know, worth more money to them. And uh, for a brewer, pulling out a little bit of alcohol, um, you know, particularly if it just means that you're pulling out some sugar or you're pulling out a couple of bags of base malt, um, you're costing almost the same amount of money. It's the same amount of labor. It's the same amount of tank time. The losses are the same. If you're dry hopping at the same rate, the, um, you know, all the, all those costs don't go away just because you've gone from 8% alcohol to 5% alcohol. And as a result, it can be really difficult to um, make a good product that is also marketable at the price point people are expecting to pay. Um, as a brewer at a brewery that you know 90% of our sales are through the tasting room, it's worth it for me just to not make quite as much money on those beers. They're still profitable. I'm still doing okay selling a $6 pint uh, on a pale ale and a $7 pint on an IPA and an $8 pint on a double IPA. 
But when you start talking about distribution and, and once we get into tasting the uh, bells and later the dogfish head, you know, we'll see how they did, you know, trying to hit that, you know, $10 six pack, $12 six pack price when you're given 30% of that to a distributor, 30% of that to the retailer, and you're only clearing, you know, three or four bucks per four per six pack. Uh, and, you know, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm getting more than that at the brewery for selling a single pint over the bar. So the economics of the whole thing are uh, a little challenging sometimes. I guess I never thought about the alcohol being sweet, but you, but you think you're saying it literally had, leaves a sweetness on the palate? A little bit. It's, it's, I was actually just having this debate with a friend of mine is, you know, alcohol, um, I think everyone uh, perceives a little differently. And certainly once you get, you know, if you're sipping on some tequila or something like that, it's not going to taste sweet. Um, but I think there's something to that uh, alcohol itself, which has an intrinsic sweetness. It's also can play tricks on you if you're just looking at your hydrometer. If a beer finishes at um, 10, 10, two and a half Play-Doh and it's 2% alcohol, the residual extract, what the real amount of sugar in there is going to be less than if it's a 10% alcohol beer that finished at 10, 10 just because that alcohol is less dense than water and that's going to throw your hydrometer reading uh, lower. And so that's one of the things we always try to do for lower alcohol beers is look for lower attenuation. Um, so we're both starting, we're starting lower, but not as low as you might expect. So where our double IPA might start at the low 1080s, a pale ale for us starts in the 1060s, even the mid 1060s, and we're looking for a similar final gravity. Um, so we're mashing hotter, we might be at our scale, we really can't select a less attenuated yeast strain because we're harvesting from the pale ale to repitch into the IPA and the double IPA. But usually where uh, the stronger the beer, we uh, lower the mash temperature by a couple of degrees. So if I back out the sweetness from the alcohol, just to, to move that in, I still want something that's flavorful. <clears throat> I want something that, you know, doesn't end up tasting like a, a macro beer or, you know, so, so how do you keep the flavor in, you know, and, and maintain all the balance? If I was going to make a flavorful IPA, how would I do it? Sure. Um, for me, it really starts with the malt because that's really the, the thing that you're watering down is by making a lower alcohol beer, you generally are starting with less malt. And um, base malt even just has an intrinsic flavor. When you make a barley wine, you really can just make it with 100% Maris Otter, maybe a little, you know, three or 4% crystal malt or something like that, just because you're adding so much malt that just it's going to be malty. And when you make a lower alcohol beer, sometimes you have to use, say, a higher percentage of specialty malt. You know, you might use something like a Golden Naked Oats that is going to have a, a nutty, toasty flavor. You might think about switching out some of your base malt rather than just using American Two Row Brewer's Malt, you know, something that is uh, one or two SRM, not a lot of toastiness. Since you're using a lot less of it, you might think about using a English pale ale malt or a German Vienna malt, something that is going to pound for pound um, because it's cooked a little bit darker, have more, more Maillard products, more melanoidins, more oomph to it. Um, you can also think about, again, like one of the great things about being a home brewer is that you can be inefficient. And so usually when you mash, uh, the first runnings are going to have the most sugar, but they'll have even more per higher percentage of the proteins that add to mouthfeel, of the beta glucans, of the uh, melanoidins. And so one thing to do is to do a party guile, so uh, a, a split batch, but I actually do it the opposite way that I think sort of the tradition is. So the tradition generally is that you take the strongest first runnings and you make the imperial stout, the barley wine, the strong beer. I actually think it's more effective to use the stronger first runnings, water them down, and then make your uh, session beer, your your uh, mild, your um, English bitter from those first runnings. And that can just be, you know, if you're making a five gallon batch, maybe just one or two gallons of those first runnings. Uh, if you water those down before the boil, you're going to have more of the uh, proteins, more of the melanoins. It's going to taste maltier, richer than that gravity would suggest. Um, Brees actually has a, a section where they talk about doing cold mashing, and that sort of even takes this to an even further point. Um, you don't heat the mash at all. You simply infuse the grains that you would do, say, for, I did it with an ESB grain bill, so something you would normally make a 5 or a 6% alcohol beer. Um, you infuse them at room temperature with water. You can recirculate for an hour or two, or you can just leave it sitting in, in your mash tun overnight. And then after that time, you run it off. 
bring it up to a boil. And what happens is you extract almost the same amount of the, again, the color, the malt flavor, the proteins, but very little of the fermentables. And so in my case, I fermented it out. It started at 10, 20 something. It finished in the 10 teens um, and it was two and a half, 2.1% alcohol, something like that. But it had great mouthfeel. It looked good. It had a nice head. Um, and that's just a really fun technique that you can do at home for making something that is um, just starting with a recipe you know. And um, again, it's wasteful. You're using the same amount of malt to make a beer that's 2% alcohol rather than five or six. But in the grand scheme of things, an extra 10 bucks for malt, if it means that you get a beer that you really love, that you enjoy, that you can drink more of, that you can um, not feel bad, you know, having one you know, for lunch, not feel bad uh, having one uh, after you get back from you know, walking the dog or whatever and, and have two or have three and rather than just having that one normal strength beer. Well, well speaking of having one, I, I've got one here that's getting warm. <laughs> oh, can we can we go ahead and play Mallet's little clip? Sounds All good. All right. Tonight. So hopefully this will work okay. I've got a short clip here from Mr. John Mallet. And we're gonna be talking about lighthearted. Uh, let me know in the uh, chat if the audio and the video look or if they're problematic. Hey everybody, it's Mallet. I'm in my office at Bell's. And I'm here today with a can of Lighthearted, which is our new low cal IPA. The beer itself has got flavor. It's got the flavor of hops. It's got some malt backbone in there. Still coming in at like 110 calories. I think that works out to about the same as a banana then it's kind of light and refreshing. You know, the beer just drinks very easily. For me, I want a beer that's got flavor. I want a beer that's got some body in there to kind of round that thing out. I want a beer that's got this sort of great hop character and you do need to balance that. I mean, this beer is tasting like beer. Uh, a lot of people don't drink light beer. A lot of people don't like light beer. And I would, I would really encourage them to give this one a try. I mean, for me, it's uh, certainly different than what we see out there otherwise. I mean, quite frankly, if you had told me that this beer was like locale, I don't know that I would have believed you. Actually, he seemed right. pretty believable, so. Mr. Mallet, he always has a way with words. <laughs> now, first thing I noticed, Michael, and I'm gonna pour mine, but I can says 4%. Ah. So. They've already changed it, apparently. So we're going to start out with a nice pour here. I muted myself. Sorry for that. Uh, mine still says 3.7. Now, that's interesting. So I've, I've got uh, a side-by-side. -side. I, I got myself a regular two-hearted. And so this is the regular full-strength two-hearted, and this is the light-hearted. And they very clearly were trying to go for the same the same look. I'd say the head retention definitely looks a little bit better on the full strength one. It's a little bit creamier. And if you can see that, sort of a little bit uh, coarser, big bubble on that. But it's, you know, honestly, not bad. Um, it looks better than the head on some of the beers we make at Saplin. Yeah, I thought I'd zoom in on that a little bit. Nice head. Well, what do you think, sir? It definitely has like there's um I mean we sort of have to transport ourselves back in time a little bit. This is not the sort of IPA that most breweries are brewing anymore. Um this is definitely a much more malt focused IPA. It's got toasty notes, it's it's more bready. It definitely isn't the just sort of hazy, juicy New England thing that has sort of taken over. Um, and a lot of that you know, is those beers don't hold up well. The hop aromatics on it are just phenomenal. I mean, it smells almost like a juicy. Wow. And it's, they always do such a fabulous job. But I can't believe, so your can says 3.7, my can says 4. Well, I, I wonder if yours is fresher than mine. I think mine says that it's, it's, it's hard to read the thing. I think it says it was canned in April. So it, mine mine has like a little bit of a piney hop kind of thing, but definitely isn't as um, as fruity and bright and orangey as uh, it can be. 
And so the full strength, full hearted, uh, two hearted is 7% in comparison. Go five, six months. Yeah, so it's, it's also a little unfair. My, my two hearted is two months fresher than my light hearted. Um, I'd say the two hearted, you can, you can clearly tell a difference. It definitely is um, sweeter, more caramel forward. It's more bitter as well. So clearly they, they cut down the bitterness in light hearted. I think maybe even more so than maybe they needed to. I thought I'd switch over. So there it is, 4%. And that, wow, I cannot read this date code. It is. Yeah, mine's, mine's kind of smudged. Mine's, mine's unreadable. Well, I think this, this one is pretty fresh uh, because the hops are just stunningly beautiful. Um, love this beer, but, and it's very drinkable. I want, I'll want i take that butt out of it. It is very drinkable. Yeah. For me, there's almost no way you can um, lighten a beer as much as they have and not have it be noticeable. I think with really good technique and the right recipe formulation, you could maybe trick someone into thinking a beer is one, one and a half, maybe 2% more uh, alcohol. There's no way you can make a 3.7% or a 4% beer taste like a 7% beer. There's just, um, it's lighter, it's crisper, it's not a bad beer. But I think if you had this at a table when you were judging IPAs, you'd just go, it's a little thin, it's it's not yeah. quite as as rich, it's... and and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's, it would be um, asking them an impossible task to make it, particularly trying to make uh, make it a scale where they're distributing it and still making some money on it. Um, I think there are a lot of sort of things we can talk about in terms of like hop character. And they've done a pretty good job. Honestly, the, the standard two heart is a little hoppier in the nose, but not a lot. And it'd be really interesting to know sort of what, what they did if... Um, I mean, for us, it's a lot of uh, just using the same amount of dry hops we normally would. If an IPA has three or four pounds of per barrel of dry hops, which is the same as it's the, you double that's like six to eight ounces in a in a five gallon batch. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's the other way. It's uh, three or four. You do is a half of that per gallon. I think it's half of this. So it's like one and a half to two ounces per gallon. So most of our beers are in that kind of range of. Um, for five gallons, seven, seven to 10 ounces, something like that. Um, that's what we do for our 5% and our 4.5% pale ales and session IPAs. Um, that, so you know, let's, we don't let's move into mouthfeel because that was what you immediately said. I think if I had these and I was judging these, I, this couldn't fool me because of the mouthfeel. So, but it's not an unpleasant mouthfeel. Mm. Many times you get beers that are substandard and they're watery. So, so how did they do that? How did they preserve the mouthfeel in this or make it as good I, as they could? I'd guess at least part of it is water chemistry. Um, one really? of the sort of more interesting experiments I did was to take the water I was going to brew with, uh, and I sent it to Ward Labs to get it a and analyzed. And then I sent the finished beer to Ward Labs to see how those water you know, minerals changed. Um, and I was really surprised. And again, it's just from the malt. So for example, um, I measured the chloride, which is a pretty important mouthfeel sort of positive uh, compound. Uh, I had 262 parts per million in my brewing water uh, with my salts added. When the beer came back, it was 448. So I almost got double the amount of chloride. Um, and if you're going to make a beer with less malt, you're also going to get less salts, less chloride, less sulfate, less sodium from uh, the grain. And so it makes a lot of sense to push up your um, your water salt additions. In the the lower the alcohol beer, the more I would increase my additions. Um, that's that's like one of the little sort of takeaways that we do is. You know, again, adjust based on what the beer is going to be. And a beer that is really low alcohol is going to need more chloride in particular. Um, you could certainly add a little more sodium, too. I think sodium can be really beneficial in terms of um, accenting malt flavor. I mean, salt makes everything taste better. You know, everything from, uh, you know, chocolate cake to, uh, you know, basically anything savory has a little bit of salt in it. 
And so I think a little bit of sodium chloride, a little bit of table salt, or a little bit of uh, another um, thing, if you're making a stat, a little bit of baking soda, uh, sodium bicarbonate can really help. Um, but otherwise, I, I think um, for malts, I don't know if they're doing it, but you could think about adding um, other grains that are higher in protein. So for example, something like spelt, something like oats, something like rye, all of those have a really um, outsized benefit to mouthfeel and body. And so if you're able to, you know, increasing the percentages of those by taking down, you know, moving some of your base malt out, but then adding uh, maybe even more than a standard recipe would have. So not only holding the percentage the same, but even maybe increasing the percentage of, um, again, those, those uh, higher protein adjunct grains, I would tend to eliminate. And I don't know if, say, Too Hearted maybe has some sugar in it. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, that's the first thing I would pull out. If a recipe, if you're brewing a Belgian triple and you want to make a, a lighter version, if you're making a West Coast double IPA and you want to make a lighter version, I'd pull out the table sugar, the glucose, the sucrose, anything like that that is going to be um, really just adding fermentables, but no protein, no body, no um, aromatics. Um, get that stuff out of there. Um, and then sort of a second tier, I'd start thinking about reducing the amount of rice, corn, um, again, you know, adjuncts that maybe aren't adding as much oomph. Um, those would be good things to think about eliminating. Um, you could certainly be mashing hotter. I, I would bet that the, I don't think that the final gravities are the same on these two, but I, if I had to guess, I would bet that the, um, where, where it's about half the alcohol, I'm sure the, the final gravity isn't half the final gravity. So I'm sure that they added a little bit more malt. Um, maybe they added, um, mashed a little bit warmer, that sort of thing. You could certainly think about adding something like maltodextrin, but honestly, um, in most cases, I think you're a lactose. I think you're better off adding more malt and mashing hotter to get more flavor, more character. Um, something like lactose or maltodextrin can be a good sort of um, adjustment post-fermentation. You know, if a beer really does dry out too much, you can boil it a little up with your priming sugar or boil it up and, and put it into a keg and um, you know add to the beer. But that water you're adding is also then diluting malt flavor and hop compounds and all those sorts of things. So um, I don't know what Bell's is doing, but, you know, clearly it's uh, it's worked well for them. Well, and it's 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 a flavorful beer, but I think it's real interesting. We discovered at the moment <laughs> that they were advertising three point seven and they've raised it to four now. I don't know if that's a perception problem for people or whether they actually did it for the the flavor or the mouthfeel of the beer. What would you think if, if you were on, on the Bell's team and there was a reason to raise it to four, what would you guess it would be? It, if it was a smaller brewery, I would just assume that it was um, this batch finished a little drier or started a little higher. Um, big breweries this size don't make mistakes like that. They uh, often are, and this may be um, fermented at a higher gravity. So they may be literally making a beer that's seven or 8% alcohol and then watering it down to get to right on target, right on spec with their alkalizer. Um, perception very much could be a thing, although it's a, it's a weird question in a beer like this, where the selling point is that it's lower calorie or lower alcohol. And I, I wonder too, this one doesn't list, it says it's a low cal IPA, but I don't think it actually says, I, I, maybe it did on the six pack. I think it says 10, 105, 110. I will have to grab the six pack, but I will. Why don't you keep talking and I'll go grab the six pack. So it, it, it could be that they, you know, changed their calorie target and they decided it was worth it to be a little bit stronger to have, um, you know, a little bit more body, a little bit more mouthfeel. Um, or it could be that they decided that, you know, they were going to dry it out a little bit more, that rather than having it be, um, you know, 4% alcohol or 3.7% that they could dry it out because the residual carbohydrates are going to add to the, um, the calorie count as well as the body and the mouthfeel can, that they were happier with a stirring at the same gravity, drying it out a little bit more and having that alcohol be maybe not quite as much of a detraction. Um, Cause this one is really being sold on, on as low calorie rather than low alcohol. And so having more calories for the same amount of alcohol for some people is a selling point. Um, not for me, obviously. This says 95 calories. 
So I, I think I could check mine. I think my dogfish head that we'll be trying later, the slightly mighty said 95, and this was more. And so I, I do wonder if they started with the same gravity and decided that they could dry it out a little bit more than they were and get more alcohol for fewer calories. Um, and that that would help it to sell more because someone looking for a low calorie, they're often looking for as much alcohol as they can get for that, for that number of calories that, you know, there are people who have the, uh, the vodka and soda just because the only calories are from the alcohol. Alcohol itself has calories. There's no way around that, but the more residual sweetness you have in there, the more empty calories you have, um, that may just be contributing to flavor and body and mouthfeel, but not to, um, the alcohol. That makes a lot of sense. Now, if, if we were brewing this as a home brew, and you said your guess was they brewed it as a, at a much higher gravity and then watered it down, what would we need to do to homebrew and get, the, get one to turn out as good as half-hearted? Honestly, if, if, if they are doing that, it would really be, I would think, mostly a cost-cutting measure that that would allow you to, um, if they, I, and I, Bell's is gigantic, they have a thousand barrel tank, you could end up starting with a thousand barrels and a full day of brewing to do um, five turns on their 200 barrel system or wherever they have. And then at the end of the process, you could end up with double that amount. You could end up with, you know, with some losses, 1800 barrels or something like that. Just to put that in context, um, you know, my brewery did a thousand barrels last year, 1200, something like that. And places like Bell's um, have single tanks that are, you know, more than our entire annual production. Um, I don't think that that's necessary. There definitely are some people who for like making um, hard seltzer and things like that. People advocate that you do increase the amount of fusels and some of the esters and some things like that. Initially, if you're making a 15, 16, 18% base, but then when you dilute it down to five or 6%, you're diluting those out lower than they would have been otherwise. So it can actually make a cleaner product. Um, honestly though, for something like this, I think for yeast, um, you often run into the problem where you're not getting enough yeast character because every time a yeast cell eats a molecule of sugar, it's making alcohol, but it's also producing byproducts, which are um, esters, which are fruity. They could be phenols, which are um, spicy and clovey in a Belgian beer or something like that. I would think you'd actually want to increase ester production. So for example, for when we brew uh, lower alcohol beers, we tend to start them at a warmer temperature. So if we're using something like Conan or something like uh, the Boddington strain, uh, London 3, we'll pitch and ferment right from the beginning in you know the low 70s, where for a double IPA, in particular a triple IPA, we might start it way down in the mid 60s, let it grow slowly, let it um, uh, be cleaner, less boozy. It's pretty hard unless you're really not fermenting without, with, if you don't have temperature control. Um, to make a 3.7% beer taste boozy. And in fact, like having just a little hint of alcohol or something like that may actually help to sell that it's a stronger beer than, uh, than it is. Um, I would look at using strains, you know, the, the Kviks, the, um, you know, the Sactois, the, the strains are going to make um, an outsized impact when you're making a smaller beer. I doubt Bell's is doing that. I'm almost certainly they're using the same yeast strain, again, just for like economic reasons. It's a lot easier to harvest from the 3.7% beer and pitch bright, healthy, great yeast cells into the 7% IPA and harvest from there and pitch into another IPA or into the double IPA or into the barley wine or the imperial stout. Um, so I doubt, I, I guess I would say I wouldn't be too concerned about uh, mimicking their process. I would try to do what sort of home brewing is best at, which is to um, optimize things and to make the trade-offs you're willing to make. Um, whereas they're making trade-offs based on uh, price points and things like that, you can make them based on, um, you know, if $5 more malt is worth a little bit more flavor, if you really do want to get every last little bit uh, out of that malt. Um, if you do that, I would still like, this is the kind of time where you might want to think about uh, monitoring the uh, gravity or the pH of your final runnings. Um, beers like this tend to, if you sparge them too much, that's when you can start getting the astringency. This is super duper clean. It doesn't have um, a roughness on the tongue. It doesn't have that tannic thing that you sometimes get that's like licking a tea bag. Um, they are clearly doing a very good job um, controlling their water chemistry. They might be, like we do, acidifying their sparge water to help reduce the amount of tannins extracted. Um, and again, just a big brewery tends to have those sorts of 
uh, best practices dialed in. And, and John's a, a really talented guy and a really smart guy. And he's been doing this for uh, probably longer than I've been alive. I'm pretty sure that he's been brewing. So, um, you know, clearly he's not going to make uh, rookie mistakes um, but as a home brewer, you know, those are the kinds of times, these are the kinds of beers you really have to tighten up your process on, um, avoid over sparging, avoid, um, you know, sparging really hot or, or anything like that. Um, and, and you should be able to get results as good as this. Yeah. I'm sure if he makes a rookie mistake, you and I would never get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Speaking of that, why don't we switch gears and go to the dogfish head slightly mighty because I think Sam played some tricks with his maybe a little differently, a little different approach that, than uh, Bell's did. That good. I'll, I'll say one of one of my sort of key points of what beer I like more is if they're both in front of me, what do I drink more of? And I drink a lot more of the lighthearted. It really is. It's a more drinkable, bright beer. Um, honestly, I, I just don't have the taste for sort of the sweeter caramelly notes in an IPA more and the lighthearted is really refreshing. And as I'm talking, it's what I want to be drinking rather than the full strength one. Yeah, it is. It is very easy drinking. Well, let's, I have a short video uh, from Sam Calagione. And uh, by the way, those of you that are in the Carolinas or in the Southeast, I found out that Sam is actually going to be at the North Carolina Brewers Guild Conference in November. I think it's November 12th. I'm going to be there, hopefully spending a little time and getting an interview with Sam. And he's also promised to do some other things with us in November. So if you're around uh, North Carolina, uh, it's at Winston-Salem. And we can see Sam there. But meanwhile, let's see what we can get from Sam here. And this is his uh, Slightly Mighty. And I hit the wrong button. Let's do that one. All right, we'll try again. Hey guys, Sam Calagione here. Just got done with one of my sports. I'm here today to talk to you about Slightly Mighty, a beer that is slight in calories and carbs, but mighty in hop character. Most light beers are very watery and totally lack body, but not slightly mighty. It packs in the flavor at only 3.6 carbs and 95 calories. How did we do it? It's all about the monk fruit, which lets us pack in the flavor without adding on calories and carbs. But what's it look like? beautiful hazy golden straw color with a powdery white head so aromatically you pick up tons of tropical hops in the nose and for flavor a beautiful balance between the nice body that the monk fruit brings it and that muscular hop profile that sits on top of it so find slightly mighty everywhere you buy indie craft beer on draft in cans and if they don't have it say what's up you need to carry slightly mighty cheers All right, I'm going to give mine a pour. Get you on screen here, Mike. I do it right. Here we go. I'm going to make my pour. Can't hear you, Mike. I did the same thing again. I've got a dogfish head 60 mint. Uh, Clearly not trying to do the same thing, but I thought it'd be interesting to try their uh, two IPAs. I'm going to try and pour this without spilling it. Got an odd angle there, and that's a bit lighter in color. Beautiful beer. Get that turned around. Pop that guy off a little bit. So what do you think? I honestly, I kind of wish I went into this without knowing it had. So um, monk fruit is essentially a natural artificial sweetener. It's in the same sort of categories like stevia. Um, To me, it's sort of it. The finish is sort of weird. It it has that not quite diet soda, but that like it. um,
Well, the, ar- the aromatics sticks to your tongue are, in a way. Yeah, the aromatics don't even compare. At least, at least mine. I get almost no hop aroma versus what I got out of that uh, lighthearted. Yeah, it's. I would say to me, it is. It's like um, it's like a fruitier thing, but it has like there's like a a, a more unpleasant kind of like a like a like a overripe or like a, like a slightly rotten tropical kind of thing. <laughs> and that's a little rough. Over overly ripe. <laughs> it's a nice way to put it. Um, yeah, this is uh, interesting. I don't think it has as pleasant a mouthfeel. The uh, hop aromatics are not even, it's not even the same league. And there's a little bit of a a bitter finish that I don't, don't know that I like. I mean, I don't want to beat it up. It's a nice beer. I'd be proud if I brewed it. Um, but just comparing the two, and I'll, I'll put them on the camera. It's just quite a color difference. I have not polished mine off like you have. I only brought down two glasses. Oh, <laughs> okay. So the full one, and I'll top that off, is the slightly mighty. Uh, it does look like it's got a little bit of lacing on it, and kind of gets a pretty head. And it's obviously considerably lighter uh, than the lighthearted. Oops, I cannot get this straight. I have got to figure out how to do that. There we go. That's what I was trying to do. Um, so quite a big color difference, quite a big mouthfeel difference, uh, quite a big, uh, I mean, they're, they're quite different. Do you, do you think, Mike, that's the monk fruit or, I mean, it's certainly not the difference in the ha- the hot flavor. No, I I think that I think they were very much going for different things. I think Dogfish Head was was trying to do um, as hazy a beer as they could because hazy IPAs are the thing now. Um, when you compare, so this is the sixty minute. I mean, obviously you can you can see me right through there yeah. versus that one. Um, whereas Bell's was trying to make a lighter version of their sort of flagship IPA. Dogfish Head clearly in their messaging and the appearance was trying to make something um, with a different appeal. Um, and that's, there's, you know, nothing right or wrong with either of those things, but you can also see how much better the lacing is on the 60 minute compared to this one that you're, you're right. It's got a couple little uh, bits on it, but it really fell off quick. Um, and that can be, a again, a, um, malt selection thing that, you know, the less malt you have in there, the less protein, um, you know, you might want to think about adding some, uh, chit malt from, uh, best or some carafoam from, Wireman or some carapils from Breeze, something that's going to help with uh, head and body and and foam. So what's the date code um, if on yours? If you're making Mine a lighter beer, January 2024 of the slightly mighty. So I would think that means it's pretty fresh. My mine says that as well. I I would hope it's a six month Best Buy. I've run into it a couple of times, and it's more on imports. But I know Pilsner or Kell does a full year. I I bought one that was five months from the Best Buy, and it was pretty awful. Um, and I, I assumed it was really fresh because they couldn't possibly have a year Best Buy on a Pilsner. Um, I don't know what Dogfish Head is doing. Um, that's one of the reasons I really dislike the Best Buy date. Um, it really sort of takes away my ability as a consumer to, to make a, a judgment. Um, yeah. Well, and that's why I was wondering, just the, the hops now in the uh, lighthearted, it pretty well yeah. all gone away. They flashed off, and now I can mostly just smell malt, malt, uh, malt. But it was a beautiful beer when I opened it. it was just so I was wondering if that was a freshness thing uh, between sure, the two sure beers. Certainly could be. Yeah. Well, I will actually ask Sam to bring some so we can talk. <laughs> bring it as fresh as possible. But yeah, honestly, that's uh, it's not a bad idea to think about ways to build in, um, you know, hop aroma or fruitiness or whatever in these lower alcohol beers. Um, you know, there's just only so much you can do. There's only so many hops you can add. Um, we do a lot of sort of advanced hop product stuff. We'll use cryo hops because those are more concentrated aromatics. We'll do 
um, hop extracts that, you know, in addition to three or four pounds per barrel, we're then sometimes on top of that adding um, like CO2, supercritical hop extracts. Um, again, trying to find ways around the fact that you don't have the alcohol because the alcohol is what helps to pull out the aromatics from the hops. And so if you're starting with 3.5% alcohol rather than 9.5% alcohol, Alcohol is a solvent. I mean, that's why there's alcohol in vanilla extract. That's why there's alcohol as a, a flavor molecule in a lot of things. Um, I mean, essentially, a lot of spirits are just neutral distilled spirits aged in oak. They're really just a solvent taking out toasted oak aromatics. Um, and so by using a hop extract for aromatics, someone has done that hard work. They have solubilized those hop aromatics. And then you can add them. And now you're not at a disadvantage that you have lower uh, alcohol. And I, I would also guess that that's something that these bigger breweries are doing. Um, you know, again, saving on losses. Every time you dry hop, the hops suck up volume that you're not going to get into a package. It takes time. You have the risk of adding astringency. You have the risk of adding more bitterness from the alpha, uh, alpha acids. Even if they don't isomerize, they can still add um, bitterness. And so I bet a lot of these places, I, I know it's very common for non-alcoholic beers to add um, hop extracts as sort of the primary um, as a small brewery, we are a both and sort of situation where we want to add as much hop as we can physically in pellets and cryo. And then sometimes on top of that, we'll add additional um, hop, hop isolates. And it's just, you know, we want as much as possible. And, and a lot of these uh, hop processors try to sell it to us as cost savings. We say we don't we're not trying to save money. We are trying to get the hoppiest beer, the most intense aromatics. The, and that's. Um, not something that's happening in these cases. They're adding that as a time savings, cost savings, um, that sort of thing. So, Michael, what do you think? I think that leads into nicely, especially the contrast that we had between these two beers. Uh, what do you think are kind of your top tips on achieving flavor depth and complexities? I think in, in the case of these two beers, light, you know, Bell's, pulled it off better if they if they were intended to be similar bells pulled it off better better than dogfish sure i i think for me i'm sorry i'm out of focus i was trying to uh, trick, trick my camera into getting back into focus um i think partly what what worked for bells is they leaned into the malt um i think to me the dogfish head is lacking the maltiness and since it doesn't also have hoppiness or doesn't also have something else it's sort of lacking where the bells, at least, there was a little bit of a toasty caramel thing that we're sort of missing in the dogfish head. Um, I think they're just, honestly, those are the styles, I think, that do better at low alcohol. I'd much rather, I mean, a Guinness is, is notoriously, people say it's a meal in a glass. And part of that's the nitro and part of that's the perception that, you know, stouts and dark beer are, you know, thicker and sweeter. But Guinness has fewer calories than than Bud Light or Miller Light or whatever it is. And it's all, you know, three point whatever percent alcohol. And people don't even notice that. Um, we didn't really even talk about nitro, but that's a really fun idea, too, for lower alcohol beers. Um, I think leaning into malt, because uh, malt is associated just in your brain with sweetness and bread and filling and rich in a way that um, fruity, hop, bright sort of flavors aren't. So I, I really think sort of the best session beers tend to be the ones that are like, malt, you know, have, have a good amount of malt or have, um, like say yeast driven again, you know, something sour, like a Berliner Weiss. Um, you know, really picking a sort of signature character that's going to give you a little bit more character oomph, something. Um, it's just really hard if you have to pinch your pennies on the hops to make the hops the star again on a beer that's, um, not being sold for as much as a normal beer. And again, even more so if you're distributing. As a home brewer, and honestly, my my tip is don't be a cheapskate. You know, use as much malt, as much hops, as much every, you know, as much water salt. You know, don't try to save money by making a low alcohol beer. Try to use all of the tools at your disposal um, to make as flavorful, as characterful, as rich, as nuanced a beer as possible. So again, you know, a variety of of more characterful malts, um, using a lot of hops at a lot of different stages using, I, we love Cascade, we love Crystal Hops. Um, so rather than adding, you know, say, say your normal recipe calls for four ounces of uh, Mosaic and Simcoe in the Whirlpool for an IPA. Rather than just adding 
two ounces of Mosaic and Simcoe in the Whirlpool and getting half the IBUs and, and half the hop flavor, I'd still add four ounces, but use a hop that's half the alpha acid. So using um, you know, four ounces of Cascade or two ounces of Cascade, two ounces of Crystal, which have almost the same sort of oil profile, although not quite as much as some of the sort of cooler hops, but they have a lot of the same compounds. Um, you might even consider using more of them. You might even consider using six ounces of Cascade and Crystal to hit the same IBUs because they're three, four, five, six percent alpha acid rather than 17, 18, 19 percent like some of the newer varieties. Um, you know, using more of everything um, to really make a beer that is um, as as flavorful. You know, you the goal isn't just to water down a beer. If that's what you want to do, you can do that. Um, I would use more malt, mash hotter, finish higher, you know, cut the IBUs, but leave as much hop flavor, as much nuance as you can in there. Um, and you can make a better session IPA than anyone else can um, when they're trying to hit that price point in the distribution game. So if if Sam said, hey, heard you were on Gourmet Brewing and you didn't like my beer as well as Mallet's, what suggestions would you have for Sam if he said, okay, what would you do, Michael? Oh. I really, there's no suggestion. I mean, it, he knows what his price point is and he knows who he's marketing to. Um, he has a lot more brewing scientists, a lot smarter people than me. I'm just lucky I don't have to compete with with them. That that's like uh, not, not the goal of being a small brewer. Um, and I'm sure he knows that, you know, how he would do it if price was no object. Um, and this is the same thing that sort of all breweries go through. You know, certainly when he was, um, you know, running his own show before they were bought by Boston Beer, there'd be real differences between, you know, what they would do for that pilot batch of something to try out unique ingredients, and then the compromises they would have to make to scale that recipe up to something that they were going to brew for national distribution. You know, for the small batch, you can use the the weird, wild, in, in, even at my scale, you know, every Thursday we tap sort of a weird one-off thing. And for that, I just view, you know, 75 bucks for um, saffron or geisha coffee or uh, some super weird, unique, you know, one-off vanilla bean from some obscure island I've never heard of or um, black truffles we've used. That all works in one keg, five gallons, 10 gallons. We're selling, you know, four or five ounce pours over the bar. It's advertising. People come in to try the weird, unique, one-off thing. I get to learn something, um, but that's not necessarily something we're then going to make into a ten or a twenty-barrel batch and have on for a month and try to send you know twenty cases out to distribution. It just the, the finances don't work. Um, and so to me, it's it's sort of like asking um, what could Stouffer's learn from a two-star Michelin restaurant. We're Stouffer's has a lot more money, a lot more research, a lot more PhDs, a lot more buying power, but they're not trying to compete with the two-star Michelin restaurant. The two-star Michelin restaurant is um, their goal is to make the best food possible. Stouffer's goal is to make the most money selling food to as many people as possible. Uh, and there's just no real um, connection on those things. And sometimes we have overlaps and we can talk about stuff, but um, my personal attitude is that I don't feel nearly as much connection to Boston Beer or Sierra Nevada or Bells as I think they should with uh, Coors and Miller and uh, Bud. That they're on, that's their, their scale. They're all trying to compete for nationwide distribution, being on tap in every airport, every bowling alley, every uh, chain restaurant. Um, I view my peers as the people who the owner is still the guy, um, you know, cleaning kegs at least once in a while in my case. Or uh, speaking of South Carolina, I was just down at a, a local farmer's market I work with uh, buying uh, muscadine grapes for a beer that I'm going to do uh, that had just come off just come off the truck from South Carolina uh, two days ago, he said. Um, you know, yeah, like that's that's what I love. That's what I think beer is good at. Um, I make low alcohol beers because it's what I want to drink, not because it's uh, what the marketing department has decided is the biggest growth area for um, beer beer growth or whatever it is. I, I, I was just at uh, my parents' house in Massachusetts and a plane flew overhead with a dogfish head banner 
about their new vodka and soda can cocktails. So, I mean, I get it. I mean, he's, he's a smart guy. He's a good marketer and he's done very well for himself. And he gave an invaluable boost to the excitement of craft beer, um, the idea of what craft beer could be. Um, but what they're doing right now is, is, you know, it's fine. So Michael, as we're at the top of the hour now, and we'd like to move into the questions. We have uh, uh, looks like three or so in there now. And the questions, for those of you that are kind of used to my programs, it used to be kind of the bottom center of the screen. Now it has moved to the right center. It's a little box with a question mark in the, in the center of it. So put your questions in there. Everybody gets a vote. So if you're in a hurry, need to get to see this wrapped up, and you want to see a particular question answered first, you can vote each one of them up. And then at the end, we will have a Zoom call that hopefully, Michael, we can twist your, your arm into joining, uh, sure. at least ever so briefly, as we can finish up these beers. So, Michael, as we wrap up and then move into the questions, uh, it sounds like, as you've described, Low alcohol, light table beers, if I can run all those words together, or those phrases, is not for the faint of heart as a brewer. You got to really, I mean, I, I heard a kind of backwards party gal or inverted party gal. Uh, you, you've thrown around a lot of uh, minerals that, and salts we need to be thinking about. If you were to summarize it, though, what where what are some of the key one two three things that you would focus in on if you're going to produce a low ABV uh, version, I guess, of a of a style beer, a, a light IPA or a light pale ale? My audience is particularly interested in a a uh, table beer, a small beer that mimics a pale ale. Sure. Um, so I would say. Focus on having the malt be as characterful as you want it to be. So, for example, uh, in our double IPAs, we'll mix in a little bit of Pilsner malt just to lighten them up. We have direct fire. The beer can get a little bit dark. And when you have that much malt, it's a bigger concern. But for the pale ales, we'll often even go the opposite way. Rather than having a little Pilsner malt, we'll add a little pale ale malt. Because we've got less malt in there total, we want to build in extra oomph to that malt flavor. We'll up the amount of oats. We might add more wheat. Uh, we might add a higher percentage of a chit malt or a carafoam, something that's going to give you uh, more head retention, better foam, because we want that beer to look as good as it tastes. Um, for hops, we try to get in as much or more total volumes of hops, and we use advanced hop products. We're not cutting corners. We are sort of increasing the amount of hops, if anything, for a lot of them. Because you don't have that alcohol that's a solvent, we're increasing water salts. So more calcium chloride in particular is very helpful for body and mouthfeel, maybe some sodium. For the yeast, we're using sort of characterful strain. We're fermenting a little bit warm. We're trying to push ester production. We're trying to increase the amount of uh, yeast character we have in there so it doesn't taste watered down or, or sort of light. Uh, we're trying to build in extra body with a higher mash temperature, maybe not as low as starting gravity as it, you'd expect. And so sort of all of that combines to sort of having a beer that really what you're looking for is that everything's exactly the same as the stronger beer, just with less alcohol. You're not trying to dilute out everything else to the same amount that you're diluting the alcohol. You want to just dilute the alcohol, nothing else. Um, so again, you know, so I made the synergy or the, the example would be if you're making a soup. Uh, if you're making a soup and you want to make it low calorie, you wouldn't cut the amount of salt in half. You wouldn't cut the amount of um, vegetables in half because they're sort of already low in, low in calories. You'd just be looking for like, hey, maybe I can pull out a little bit of the, the olive oil. Maybe I can pull a little of the meat out. And maybe, hey, I could add back some of that instant bouillon that is going to give me that flavor without actually having to have the whole, you know, the whole chuck roast in there or whatever it is. And that's really what I'm trying to do with um, these beers. I'd also say that for like a lot of other beers, like just go for something that's already a lower, lighter beer. You know, making an Irish dry stout, a Berliner Weiss, a Saison that finishes really dry. Um, you know, the sort of traditional, um, a, a lot of the, the Czech 10P lagers, um, 
there are already styles that are designed around this that sort of lean into that lower alcohol and, um, you know, explore what the world of session beers that's already out there is, even if they're not called light or, or table or whatever, sometimes they're just called beer and that's fine too. You know, there are some styles that, you know, four, four and a half percent alcohol is, is full strength. And oftentimes those are better than a, um, a light double IPA or something like that. So I think I'm hearing essentially the same amount of everything except fermentables. Yeah. Yeah. That's and and in some cases, more of the stuff, more water salts to make up for the fact that you have less malt and some of those salts come from malt. Um, maybe even more hops, depending on what varieties, you know, picking lower alpha acid varieties rather than the, the, the full, you know, high alpha ones. But really, it's um, I would make light beer because I like drinking more beer, not because I was trying to save money. Um, I really think that uh, sometimes you're better off having. Honestly, I I think I drink more alcohol when I have really light options available. It's easy to drink two really crisp light lagers than one really thick, heavy imperial stout. Sometimes that imperial stout, I end up drinking half of it and forgetting about it. Because it's, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't lead you on to that next sip. You make a perfect session beer. It's easy to drink one and then go, I'll have another one. And then half an hour later, oh, you know, I'm, I'm thirsty again. I'll have one of those. Particularly this time of year when it's hot in summertime, you know, it's put, put a big peanut butter imperial stout in front of me and I'll have three sips of it and I'm done with it. And and you shouldn't look at it or expect a cost savings because it from a brewing point of view, it's maybe more effort than a big beer. It's, I would say it's at least the same amount of effort. Um, and particularly, I mean, as a home brewer, like if you love it and you love the hobby, I think I liked it. You know, I, when I was a home brewer, I liked brewing. I, I didn't mind making something that was a little bit lighter. Um, and again, you can think about the party guile thing where you could get, you know, two different batches out of the same uh, brew day. So you could have one beer, you know, you take the first gallon or two, dilute it down and make a, a mild or a, a, a English bitter, and then just keep sparging, keep collecting, boil. You can add some malt extract if you, or some sugar, um, and then make something that is uh, more characterful. And then have one one to drink fresh, one to age. Um, I, I used to do a lot of that stuff as a home brewer. I would uh, split a batch and do you know half some Pilsner, half some Brett Saison. Um, there are a lot of sort of uh, fun things you can do with a with a split batch as a as a home brewer. It's difficult to do as a professional brewer where we only have one kettle. So is that where the mad part came in for the mad fermentist? The the mad fermentationist was uh, it was just a mad scientist. It was <coughs> vaguely inspired by Dodola Brewers, where, where they were the mad brewers. Um, but my my goal when I started the blog in two thousand six or two thousand seven. And early on, I did. I did sourdough bread. I did kombucha. I did ginger beer plant. Um, I made bread with Britannomyces. I, I did a lot of sort of um, just general sauerkraut, like fermentation stuff. And and uh, I did mead. I did sake. I did. I've done wines. I've done sort of all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and so it was really sort of me trying to have enough uh, breath where I wasn't just about brewing. Um, I, I love brewing. I love home brewing because it's not something you have to keep going. I was never great at keeping, you know, you have to feed the sourdough starter uh, once every couple of days. Or if you want to want to make a bread, you have to three days before take it out and feed it and step it up. And um, kombucha was like that. Ginger beer plant was like that. Um, I The only kind of pets I can have are pets like our cats and dogs that, you know, they let you know if they haven't been fed because I might not remember otherwise. Um <laughs> I love and, your but honestly, like, honestly, having the blog has been sort of super invaluable. Uh, starting the brewery and my partner, Scott Janish, who I think you had on a couple of years ago, yeah. um, also had a blog, has a blog, although neither of us post as much as we used to um, now that we spend every day talking beer and, and, and dealing with beer. Um, but being able to go back to those things, particularly the first couple of years and like, hey, should we do an IPA with El Dorado? Let me look back at my blog. Have I ever? Oh yeah, I, I liked it. Okay, let's do something with El Dorado. Um, you know, um, like your brewer's and, log. And honestly, I I didn't appreciate <clears throat> early on how valuable it was that I had write ups for every one of those beers. And for the first year or two, 
I sort of fell into the trap of just like, oh, you know, like we we have, you know, six or seven beers on tap and we have a new batch every month or so. And I'll, I'll remember how these were, you know, this is a big part of my life now. And then a couple of years in, I started going, you know, I just don't remember that beer. I, you know, I, what did I think of that one? Um, and now I have a 120 page document of my write-ups for every single beer we've, we've brewed in the last three years. And so I can look back through it. Hey, you know, we only do, we've done 700 beers, I think in our, in our five years, which is just ridiculous. Um, but I'll go back and look and, and really to me that the most important thing, if you don't record anything else is if I brewed this beer again today, what would I change? And ideally I try to try the beer next to a good example. If I'm making a double IPA, I get a Trillium, a Treehouse, an other half, something from a good local brewery that's super fresh. And I sit there and I drink both of them and I think about it and I try to look for trends. There's nothing much to say if this one's a little bit better than that one. But if, say, for a while, I found that our beers were always a little bit more stringent, a little bit more harsh than almost every other beer. Um, and we started looking at our dry hop temperature and lowering our dry hop temperature because that was something that um, was supposed to reduce, and Scott had been pushing for it for years, um, reduce uh, uh, tannin extraction, polyphenol extraction. Um, but then we weren't getting as much aroma. So then we had to look into how we were agitating the beer after we dry hopped it because hops fall more quickly. And so, you know, how do we resuspend them? Um, but that's the kind of thing you don't notice unless you're really paying attention to your beer, um, sitting with it, not just having a sip and writing down the, the aromatics you get, but really, and again, I mean, it's honestly one of the tests I use, which beer am I drinking more of? I, I might spend the first half of each beer um, thinking about them and analyze them analytically, but then I just want to sit there and watch something on Netflix or YouTube and just sort of notice which one gets emptied first. And again, this one's the opposite. I've been drinking a lot more of the 60 man. I think I already refilled my glass and not the slightly mighty. Um, you know, almost using yourself as a, it's not quite a blind experiment, but you know, sort of the um, Michael Jackson used to call it Moorish. You know, what beer calls on you to have another sip of it? What beer, you know, finishes in a way that invites you to take another sip? And that's something that I think is, hard to describe and hard to um, notice or hard to um, analyze um, cog like cognitively. It's something that's almost a subconscious um, reaction of which one do I find myself going back for? Which, you know, which snack bowl gets emptied first? Which one do I keep eating even if I don't think I like it better? Well, let's get through our questions and then we can jump on the Zoom call. Uh, looks like we've got four at the moment, uh, and looks like we've got roughly 45 minutes. So I would take your time with them. Uh, but, you know, if we end up early, good. We'll jump on the Zoom, and we all get out here a little earlier. Uh, so for those that have to go and aren't, aren't going to stay for the questions, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, Michael, this was a lot of fun. I can't wait to get into the uh, questions. So. Excellent. I'm, I'm happy if anyone has questions about other stuff. Again, we do a lot of barrel age, sort of weird forage stuff. We do a lot of hazy double IPAs. We do a lot of, shockingly now, we've got a bunch of like top 10 rated loggers on Untap. So I, I really, uh, at this point, can, can answer a lot of oddball questions, a lot of uh, technical questions. If you've got something that's unrelated to uh, session beers or lower alcohol stuff, happy to. All right. Well, Jimmy has our first question. And Jimmy asked, do you think lower ABV beers are a good place to mess with more specialty malts to boost the flavor or adding more weed or flaked ingredients to avoid the beer from being too thin? Definitely. Um, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking about specialty malts as a percentage. So um, if your imperial stout is 5% roasted barley, you might want to make a session stat that was 5% roasted barley. Um, the problem with that is that the roasted barley, it's really the, the actual amount per gallon that's going to give you the flavor you're looking for. And you may want to back it down a little bit. Um, the sweetness in an imperial stat is going to help balance in the same way um, ho you know, hops and sweetness balance. The bitterness of a roasted grain is going to help to um, cut through that sweetness in the imperial stat. If you had a 4% alcohol stout that was has much roasted barley as the imperial stout. It's going to be overly bitter, harsh, um, ashy, those sorts of things. 
Um, I think there's somewhere in between where you're maybe going, if you're cutting your base malt in half, maybe you're only going down, um, you know, so it'd be down 50%, you're only going down 25% on the specialty malt, something like that. Um, and this is all compounded by the fact that you're probably going to get higher efficiency on the low alcohol beer. And that's going to end up with um, better extraction, not just of the sugars, but also the malt flavors and everything like that. Uh, but I would definitely um, think about, particularly if it's a malt driven style of, you know, having a higher percentage, maybe a slightly lower total amount, though, of uh, crystal malts, um, roasted grains. Um, but then when it comes to the the flake grains, the oat, the rye, the anything like that. Um, Scott was always a big advocate of quinoa and we've only done one, uh, but flake quinoa was sort of one of his uh, tricks for high protein, um, you know, adding body and mouthfeel and head retention, all those sorts of things without having to have a huge amount of more grain. Um, I would think about, again, maybe even increasing the total amount of those. If there's one pound of that in your full strength, you might even be thinking about one and a half or two pounds in the lighter version, you know, reducing that base malt even more. Um, you just have to be careful at that point that you're not reducing your base malt so much that you're going to have conversion problems, that you still have enough of the amylase enzymes to be able to convert all those starches into sugar. Okay, you're looking for a little bit lower attenuation. So if you're a little bit light on, on enzymes, you're okay. Um, but I'd start getting worried, say you really went all in and you were only using, say, a Maris Otter, which is pretty low in enzymes, and you're really upping the flake grains, and you're really upping the, the uh, crystal malt you might start running into trouble with um, just getting good conversion. And so in that case, you know, consider, um, we've had great luck with the Brees uh, two row and pale ale malt. We had some real trouble uh, early on with some other American uh, malt suppliers, uh, but the Brees stuff has done really well for us. And it's um, uh, dynamic in terms of, um, you know, making sure you can use a lot of adjuncts and things like that. If you had to, you could always use, um, uh, purified fungus derived enzymes. Um, we haven't done much of that. It doesn't generally feel worth it, but um, that certainly could be an option if you really were pushing the amount of specialty malt, unmalted grain. Um, again, you know, just make sure you're using enough rice hulls and whatever else if you're not uh, brewing a bag to uh, make sure you can extract that wort once it's done converting if it's got uh, lots of oat and wheat and rye and crystal and roasted and almost no base malt. But yeah, I think I, hopefully that answers the question, but feel free to follow up if it did not. All right, we'll move on to our next one. Jimmy has the next most popular question. And he's going to put ask you to put on your brewery hat. As a brewery owner, do you rename a low ABV beer away from the correct style, like a dark mild, with other adjectives or something to increase sales? I, to me, that's honestly, it's less of a question specifically for low alcohol beers, um, although notoriously mild and bitter are not uh, great sales terms. Um, Saison is sadly not a great sales term at the moment. Um, I am always in favor of describing what beer is. And I I think it would be weird to name something... Um, I'm I'm a big I'm obviously as a blogger I'm big on communication I write we do like a we release three or four beers every week and I'm the one who writes the email that sort of like says here are the new beers but also like here are the special decisions we made and here's why we're doing this and here's where the name came from and here's what I what I think the beer tastes like um, where we're tasting room focused there's only been sort of a handful of times where I think we did. Uh, a Maybach, a Hellesbach, and I think the tasting room staff ended up calling it an Imperial Pilsner or something like that because the a Maybach, Hellesbach was not selling well. Um, since we don't have that much beer going out to stores, what's actually on the can, I view more as a direct communication to the person drinking the beer. Um, and so that, like, I'd rather tell them what the style is, even though I have to say, check style dark lager instead of Tamave Pivo or whatever it is. Um, I, I don't think generally that the style name is what turns people off in a tasting room environment where there is a bartender who can talk to them about what they like. And even if it says dark mild and the person says, oh, I really like brown ales, you can say, oh, 
that's pretty much just the slightly lower alcohol version of uh, uh, English mild of the uh, English brown ale. Um, I I don't think words like light are appealing to the demographic we have. I don't know that session is an especially appealing word. I think people dig the concept, particularly a place like us. We don't get a lot of foot traffic. We're in the back of a um, of a you know flex use you know warehouse kind of thing. Um, people are driving there. We see, and honestly, more and more time has gone on. The pale ales and the IPAs do better and better on draft, and our double IPAs are selling less and less on draft. Double IPAs still sell great uh, to go four packs, whatever. But the people sitting there having two or three beers in the tasting room know that they shouldn't drink too much alcohol. You know, we're we're in the DC metro area. A lot of people have have good government jobs, have contractor jobs, where if they get pulled over for DUI. Um, it, the DUI may not be as serious as the ramifications for their job. Um, and so we try to be very cognizant of that and, and have lower alcohol options always available, although um, it can be tricky depending on what sells and what doesn't sell. But <clears throat> luckily, we've seen, you know, the the Pilsners. Uh, we just did sort of a Kolsch blowout day where we uh, did the sort of cologne style service where the small strange stanja glasses keep coming until you 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 know say to stop, but they're four point something percent alcohol, and it's a, a fun afternoon activity for folks. And um, you know, it's mar marketing has never been my strong suit, and I don't care for breweries where the marketing department is in charge of anything. I think the marketing department, the social media, should uh, be brewer driven. And not the other way around. So, Jimmy, I was trying to get him to use the light beer when we were first starting in the opening question. He, he Michael, absolutely refused. <laughs> so, so he has some strong opinions on that. Well, to, right. to me, light beer, light beer tends to, I mean, it really tends to be a name that uh, uh, Budweiser and Miller and Coors are associated with. I think most craft beer drinkers, light is sort of a negative word. Um, light means light flavor. Light means um, it's not a real craft beer. Craft beer is a thousand IBUs and it's double barrel aged and it's triple dry hopped. And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, Scott has a bit he does about, you know, sort of tough guys who would never go into a bar and, and order a fuzzy navel. But if there's a fuzzy navel, navel smoothie sour being released at the brewery around the corner, they'll wait in line and get that fuzzy navel sour beer. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that there is some some amount of um, machismo, whatever, wrapped up in beer that, um, that a lot of the breweries that get a lot of excitement have very sort of, you know, like hardcore, dark imagery. This, you know, this is serious. This is, you know, um, this is metal. This is punk. This is whatever. Um, yeah, I'd love to see somebody do a study it. on lighthearted. Although well, I think that's this more to of a, play is a very, like this is, feels very seventies, right? This is like going after somebody who's it, it does remembers their dad drinking. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I, I, I was born in 83, so I actually don't know, but felt like that, that sort of, you know, sepia tone. Yeah. Um, and that's, I, I, Again, like marketing is, I, I was an economist. I, I love flavor. Um, I do our social media, but it's, it's not something I uh, I love. I just, I, it's a necessary thing that has to be done. And um, you have to make a fool out of yourself a little bit. But, you know, people love people. Love people. I mean, it's, you've talked about when we were talking, you know, people want to see someone talking about beer. They it's easy to take good photos of a can of beer, or a glass of beer. You set it up. I get my tripod, my DSLR. I, I get the lighting right. I pour the beer. Snap, snap, snap. Let's get some more angles. Um, those photos never do half as well as a blurry photo of one of the brewers doing something interesting or one of the bartenders pouring a beer. Yeah. Even though it's not as aesthetically pleasing of a photo, there's a real value in having a human in there, the ingredients rather than the finished product. Um, it's a way for us to remind people that, you know, there are a lot of breweries that when they make a orange, an orange beer, it's a bottle of orange syrup, concentrate extract, whatever. When we do it, we're zesting. We did a beer recently with uh, a thousand lemons in it. 
there was a there's a great YouTube video by uh, Chef John from foodwishes.com where he makes a lemonade in, uh, you know just a, a state fair lemonade uh, and I did it as a keg and it was a case of lemons it was I forget it was 60 or 70 lemons that I zested mixed with sugar to make oleosaccharum the sugar pulls out the oils um, then we juiced the lemons and we blended it together with a Berliner Weiss. And again, it was just a fun once a week, one off. We're never going to do this again. Boy, that was a pain in the ass. Um, and people just just loved it. And so we did our first batch and we zested, I think it was 1,100 or 1,200 lemons. Um, we juiced them all by hand. Um, and it was a 5% alcohol beer, but we charged $24 a four pack for it because it was a lot of lemons. It was a lot of work and people loved it. It was the quickest, I think, a beer is, has kicked for us uh, on a big batch. Um, we're lucky to live in, to, to brew an area where people have disposable income, where the economy has done well and um, beer is an affordable luxury. And so we're lucky to be able to use the best ingredients, use as much of them as we want and still stay in business. And, yeah, and for us- $24 for a four pack. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, we, we try that. Yeah, that's, that's a good bottle price for a barrel age Imperial step from us. Um, yeah, it really but, is. But well, let's, we, let's move into our next question. Eric sure. has been waiting patiently. Thank you, Eric. Uh, is actually glycerin a viable option for mouthfeel? And is it different at the pro level versus home brewing? Um, so glycerin or glycerol, I believe they're the same thing, is a yeast byproduct. And certainly I actually had this on my list and didn't get to it. People always talk about French Cezanne is producing a lot of glycerin. Um, it's a big thing in the winemaking industry. A lot of winemaking strains, when you look at winemaking strains, will say this is a glycerin positive or glycerin plus plus or whatever um, strain. So glycerin is a, a mouthfeel positive, perceived sweetness. And there is vegetable glycerin. And I have a bottle of it at the brewery because Scott has been threatening to have a bunch of strains tested. And I said, let's just buy some and mix it in and see see what it does. Um, we haven't actually played around even in on you know benchtop trials of actually dosing it. Um, but uh, sadly for brewer's yeast, there just isn't a huge amount of information out there about which strains do and don't produce it how much of it they produce relatively, those sorts of things. It definitely is something that is a valuable area of research. But if any of the big breweries have done it, they've not made that information public. Um, well, can you... I, I hope it's something that like White Labs or Y Yeast or Imperial or Omega like gets their strains tested for and, and starts marketing that as like a selling point, but that hasn't happened yet. Well, uh, uh, can you add food grade glycerin and accomplish the same thing? Uh, I don't know if we're allowed to do that or not. I, it's not something, uh, every time you, you have a new recipe that has anything unique in it, um, in the United States, we have to submit a, a formula. It's called phonal, uh, for, uh, I don't even know what it's formulas, something, something, something. Um, and so you would then have to list, I want to add this amount of glycerin and they would either say yes or no. Um, the trick with that generally is to find somebody else who does. And then if they've gotten it approved, you can say, please reference this approval prior. Um, I deal with that stuff for like staghorn sumac and acorns and stuff like that. Uh, luckily, we don't add anything too weird on the sort of the process aid side. Um, and most of those sort of standard you know, yeast nutrients or clarifiers are already pre-approved. So that's not a problem. Um, so I, I haven't looked into it. I don't know what the what the story is. Um, as a home brewer, it's, again, it's one of the great things about being a home brewer. You can add a bottle of white wine to your beer. You can add whatever uh, thing you you know pick when you're out for a walk because uh, you're the one who's at risk if it doesn't go well. As a commercial brewer, there's always a little bit of a fight to find those loopholes or, or find that um, sweet spot where we're allowed to do something. Um, and often there's well, just sort I of- I think um, food grade glycerin is in a lot of things. Whether it's in beer or not, I don't know, but food yeah. grade glycerin is not uncommon. Yeah, and you you can buy it. We have bought it from Amazon, so it's it's certainly available. And that all, if you can buy it from Amazon, it's got to be okay. <laughs> Eric, great question. Uh, let's move into John's. Uh, 
John asks, how do you compare this trend in North America with what's already standard procedure in English pubs? And I think he's speaking of milds versus our discovering lower alcohol beers. Yeah, I mean, I... I, when I travel, uh, it's always super interesting. I, my wife and I just went to Scotland for our 10th anniversary. Um, and it was really interesting to go to these um, classic pubs in, in Glasgow. And um, as we sort of made our way up to Skye and back around through Edinburgh, um, how many dry hopped, hazy-ish things that were on cask. Um, Again, low alcohol, but my understanding is a lot of that is that there is um, economics incentives, whether it's uh, taxes or whatever, for breweries that are doing sort of these lower alcohol things. Um, I was honestly a little underwhelmed by going to one of the birthplaces of, of you know, real ale and, you know, that the Scottish, um, you know, shillings or ambers, as they call them just works so well on cask, you know, a malty, caramelly uh, beer served warm and low carb really works well. It really accentuates and highlights and improves that style. I don't think a, a two or two and a half or three and a half percent citra dry hot beer that has to be exposed to oxygen in the cask with the spile I don't think that that makes that beer better. I think when they were at their best, they were almost as good as a fresh session IPA in the United States. And at their worst, they were undrinkable and terrible. Um, and so I think it's interesting to compare and contrast like places that have an established beer culture, um, England, Ireland, Germany, um, that have sort of um, taken American craft brewing ingredients, I think, and applied them more so to existing styles versus when I've gone to places like um, Brazil or Scandinavia that really all they had was some light lagers that no one was that enthusiastic about. And they've sort of gone the opposite way. They have taken ingredients that they can get locally and applied them to American craft beer or international craft beer styles. So like Amburana wood in uh, Brazil or the, uh, you know, using the fun tropical Amazonian in the Catarina, Catalina sours. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, I mean, I guess sort of six, one, half a dozen, the other with the uh, Scandinavians, they've got the Kaviks and they've got the weird, unique smoked malts, but then they were also sort of leaning into, um, you know, adding juniper to IPAs and sort of, you know, harnessing, um, their local flavor palette for, um, uh, you know, the sort of newer styles. Um, and so that's a long way of saying, um, I think Americans do what they always do. Americans take things from other places and they do them even more so. We take pizza and we make it uh, stuffed crust, double spicy pepperoni, extra cheese, um, and then we're going to remix it and make uh, Greek chicken pizza. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's our, it's our national personality. And that's what we do with beer. We take um, IPA. That is something that is basically dead. We take Porter was basically dead. Oatmeal stout was basically dead in England. Americans saw those things, saw the potential, revived them. And in a lot of cases, the, English brewers only started rebrewing them after American craft breweries did it first. Um, Goza was long dead in Leipzig before it was brought back again. Um, there are a lot of those styles that don't have a continuous history. Um, I mean, yeah, Belgian Lambic, one of the best, most characterful session beers possible, basically was on life support 30 years ago, other than people in America, people in England, people in Japan eventually. Um, buying them and putting a, a, a connoisseur spotlight on something that was viewed to be uh, the drink of old people and not something that was, you know, uh, worth anything other than a, a tax write-off for a, a museum. Um, and I, again, it's, it's the American character to uh, take things from other places, latch onto them, do them to death, uh, get way too excited about them, and then move on to the next thing.
Uh, and I'm, I'm glad craft beer has kept going now for, you know, almost 40, 45, 50 years. Um, you know, sad to see places like uh, Anchor Brewing not, not continue on. Glad to see places like uh, Sierra Nevada, you know, still be able to uh, be, you know, successful in putting out new beers. And um, I hope that continues. I hope they keep displacing uh, Budweiser and Coors and Miller. And I, I hope uh, small breweries keep eating uh, the, the sort of specialty market from the, the large scale craft brewers. Um, I don't know how it is other places. I, I track sort of the Maryland brewery uh, opening and closings in the last year and a half or so. We've lost, I think, close to 10 breweries. They tend to be bigger. Um, Flying Dog uh, got bought by Saranac. They, they left the state. Duclaw got bought by River Horse. They left the state. Uh, Guinness just closed up their production part of their facility that was in Baltimore. Um, but we've had 20 new breweries open and most of them are small, you know, brewer driven, passionate, um, making great, interesting, unique beers. And I would lose one thousand barrel, 10,000, 100,000 barrel brewery and get two, you know, 500 barrel breweries in its place every single time. Because that's, you know, that's how we all survive. You know, you can have 100,000 restaurants in the United States and that's okay. You can't have 100,000 uh, Hormel chilies or uh, craft foods. So I think is the short answer is you wonder if it will be sustained since Americans tend to go at it really hard and then maybe lose interest. Yeah, I mean, like... All the breweries that jumped into seltzers, I don't think that seltzers are growing, you know, hard seltzers are growing at nearly the rate they were. Now everybody's doing canned cocktails. And um, yeah. I, I hope that as more people want to drink craft beer, but then are uh, health conscious or alcohol conscious or whatever it is, that more of them move towards, you know, lighter, more refreshing, characterful beers rather than drinking Bud Light. Um, and obviously some of that is price point, you know, that it's for a lot of people, if Bud Light is um, 15 bucks for a 30 pack, yeah, they're not going Which to say, well, is. for the same alcohol, I can, I can get, um, you know, two six pack or one six pack of, you know, uh, Dogfish Head or Sam Adams. And so, you know, for, for me, the question is always, I, I want to drink as much characterful beer as possible. I don't care about the money. Um, and that's easier now that I, I just get free beer uh, at work. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it really, it's a big difference on what I bring home. I mean, I'm, I'm bringing home the Pilsner. I'm bringing home the Pale Ale. I'll bring home a couple of the IPA or the double IPA to sit down and, and think about them. But I'm not just popping a double IPA very often just to drink it. Yeah. All right. Great question, John. Uh, we've got a couple more. They keep piling up here. Michael, you're, you're sparking a lot of interest. Excellent. Uh, Edward has our next question. Is there a good rule of thumb for one to 2% ABV beer? Say like removing the base malt and doubling up specialty, uh, DP grains like, uh, Carahel and dextrin malt. So to me, I mean, there, there's sort of two approaches. I've, I've done a couple of that, that two-ish percent. The cold mashing, again, you know, not heating the mash at all, mashing at low temperature so that you are extracting just the um, melanoidins, the proteins, the color compounds um, is a really good option. The other one is to just go and mash ridiculously hot. I did um, an all uh, Nelson Savin hopped rye, pale ale thing um, that started, I think, in the 1030s and finished pretty close to 1020. Um, and that one, I think I mashed it 161 or 162, a lot of rye malt to add that body. Um, and still, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to taste light, um, but I think that's sort of the best approach. The other sort of um, angle you can look at is uh, yeast strain selection. I don't know how easy these are to get, um, but there is a, sorry if I hit my mic, looking, 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 what is the name of it? Uh, there is a, it's called Near. Be, be careful, remember your computer locked up the last time we were doing this. Uh, uh, CHR Hansen has something called SmartBev Near. Um, and it's a, it's a yeast strain that freeze files. It's a wild strain. It's pretty interesting. Um, but it can also be used to make low alcohol beers. Um, if you want it to be 0% alcohol, you keep aerating. And as long as it has oxygen, it's going to 
uh, respire instead of ferment. But otherwise, it will just ferment, but it can only ferment glucose. Um, and so that's a strain, and again, it's a liquid strain, and it's only available from this specific lab. As a commercial brewery, it might be something you want to look into. Um, we played around with it. We were pretty happy with the results. It was a little sulfury. You got to deal with that. But um, it gets rid of, there's like a worty flavor, like a unfermented flavor that a lot of beers get if they don't ferment at all. Um, and that's one of the big issues with like 0% alcohol is either you need to ferment them and then remove the alcohol or you need to find some way to sort of uh, <clears throat> process and get rid of that flavor. Um, but general for a rule of thumb though, I you, I mean, you can certainly, I, I have not tried just like, you know, essentially making a, a malt extract recipe where you steep the specialty malts, but then don't add a malt extract. That, and that would certainly be an option. Um, I don't know that that's going to get you all the way, uh, but it certainly could be a good first step. Um, a lot of crystal malt is close to 50% fermentable, um, particularly the paler stuff. The darker crystal malt gets, the more um, unfermentable it is. Um, yeah, I, I, it's certainly worth a try. Um, I don't know the results, though. It's not something I've tried. Um, but that's... Um, so if I, I take, you know, think about all those other things, you're making sure you're getting enough um, of the minerals in there, making sure you're fermenting it as hot as possible just to get some amount of um, yeast character. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, there, there's no simple answer to a lot of this stuff. Um, and it just takes a lot of, you know, repeated batches and, and tweaking things and figuring out what works for your palate. So Todd has our next question, <clears throat> which he admits is a little off topic, but he says, I see your sapwood sellers website to use enzymes to reduce gluten products that I assume are like clearzyme or seller science. Do you notice a taste hit from using these? And is it true that celiacs are able to drink these beers? Um, I don't notice the difference. Um, and it's honestly there. We, we use uh, Brewers Clarex, which is the, the more concentrated version of Clarity Firm from White Labs. Um, ours is from, I forget who is it, D, DS something or other. Um, Scott thinks it lightens up the body a little bit. Um, we don't brew the same beer very often. And so we've yet to be able to do like a, a side by side where I'm drinking the exact same beer. I, I don't notice it. Um, if it is different, um, it shouldn't be. It's just taking a protein linkage and, and cutting that one particular protein. Um, we've gotten a couple of our beers tested, and um, initially we were coming in low. We were still getting detectable gluten at the recommended rate, and so we've now upped the um, dosing rate and still not seeing any issues. And honestly, like we add to all of our pale ales, and they're still super duper hazy. Um, at the rates we're dry hopping and with the oats and with the yeast strain we have, um, it, we add it to like loggers and it does help clear up the loggers, um, uh, but it doesn't seem to overcome the extreme haze causing situation that, uh, is going on with, um, hazy IPAs dry hopped at, at higher rates. Um, I got an email from a brewer in India who, who swore that he was getting a very different flavor from um, his beers when he was adding it. Um, I, I, again, I don't notice it. It's probably is something that we should like dose. It's always hard, you know, if you dose like a five gallon split batch or something, is that really then getting the same fermentation, the same dry hopping? Are there any other factors? It would be, um, it, it's hard to hold that many things constant and, and have a reliable test when what you're looking for is so subtle. Um, and you have to add it as early as possible. Once the pH starts dropping with fermentation, it's not nearly as effective. Um, but we've, we've had good luck with it. Um, we dose, there's a calculator online that we use and we now just use like, a, it's like the four PPM per Play-Doh per whatever rate. It's like the clarity in a dry hop beer or something, even though a lower rate is supposed to take care of it. Um, but that works for us. Um, but it beer can just be so... Um, not compatible with so many people. Uh, there are, you know, there are always going to be people who don't drink alcohol and we stock non-alcoholic beers from uh, Go Brewing at the moment. Um, 
there's always going to be people who are vegan. Scott's vegan. And so all of our beers are vegan other than I get one honey beer a year since that's almost kind of good for, you know, local agriculture or whatever. Um, you know, I, we try, I, I, I'd rather not use lactose anyway. People are lactose intolerant. People keep kosher. Um, unless it's something that like, again, I love honey because it's a local product that there's no way to replace, but something like lactose, I'd rather allow as many people as possible to drink our beer and not be their breweries. They'll just say, Oh, this is our oat cream IPA, but cream in that case, you have to know it means lactose, but they're not going to say it contains lactose. Um, and the, the enzyme thing is the same thing. If I can make a beer that more people can drink, that more people feel comfortable drinking, um, there definitely are people who want, and, and the federal government has pushed more and more, that there's a, a difference between um, gluten-reduced enzymatically and 100% gluten-free. So our ciders are 100% gluten-free. Our uh, yeast supplier, uh, Bootleg Biology, grows up the mad fermentation of Saison blend that they bank for us uh, on sorghum. So that even the yeast itself is not adding any potential gluten. Um, there are some people that's, you know, they want to know that's 100% gluten free. That's saying, hey, we add this enzyme. We haven't had this batch tested, but other batches have been clear. Um, isn't good enough for them. And then there are some people who just say, oh yeah, you know, it doesn't affect me that much. I'll try it if I feel okay. I'll keep doing it. And if not, you know, I'll stick with the cider. Um, so I'd, I'd like to be as inclusive as possible as I can with beer. Um, and, and that enzyme helps a little bit. Um, so much of what we do is, you know, rotation we're focused. We don't want to get vetoed. If there's someone who really wants to drink a hard seltzer, that's definitely gluten-free or a cider. Um, we have those options. We always try to have, you know, a lighter, more approachable Pilsnery, Kolshi, something. We always try to have some bottles of the barrel aged sour stuff, the barrel aged imperial pastry stuff. Um, because we're really competing against good beer bars. There's some great beer bars near us and you can go there and try beer from 75 different breweries. Um, and we're never gonna be able to replace all of that, but we can say, hey, our bartenders know all these beers, all these beers are made on premises. They're gonna be fresher than you're going to get at someplace that has 110 taps. You know, a lot of that beer is gonna be sitting around for three months before it runs out. Hey, none of our IPAs last for more than three or four weeks. They're all gone. We put a new IPA, double IPA every about three weeks. A 20 barrel batch is gone before that. On to the next one, it's fresh. It's going to be good. Um, come back and see us in the back of the, the parking lot sometime. Michael, uh, Viola has corrected us a little bit. She says Goza was long dead in Goslar, if I'm pronouncing that right, where the style originated from but kept it alive in Leipzig. Excuse the correction. So, My, my understanding was that uh, when, when they revived it, they found a brewer who had brewed it at the last brewery that had uh, been, been still operating uh, in Leipzig, but then uh, they had closed and they'd found the brewer and they resurrected the recipe, but there was not constant production of it. I, obviously, this this could be bad information, but that's that's the story I remember hearing from um, Bonshoff or whoever who base Basehoff whoever whoever it is that's got the guy with the photo and the weird bottle and and that sort of stuff. But it's not my area of expertise, so I I will take the correction if I'm incorrect. Well, it has the next question. So basically, and by the way, she is in Germany in Hamburg, so she's got a late evening. Uh, or early morning. So basically you're using an ordinary yeast, but kind of stopping it. Is this what we know as arrested or stop fermentation? If that's the case, they often taste like un unfinished wort in my experience. So what about working with a different yeast like uh, Ludwigy, if I pronounce that anywhere close to right, that that to my knowledge doesn't produce alcohol while it's fermenting. Yeah, okay, beginner's question, but I drank these beers for nearly a year. Um, so I'm not arresting uh, fermentation by like cold crashing it or something you might do, a uh, keeving in a cider or something like that. Um, uh, we're mashing hotter and so we're producing more of uh, unfermentable dextrins, things like that. Um, often the issue, I, I don't, I haven't looked into the Ludwigi, if it's similar to the CHR Hansen's, whatever it is. 
Um, the issue with a lot of those is they only ferment uh, glucose. And if you still have maltose, maltose is still, it's not nearly as sweet as sucrose. It's not nearly as sweet as glucose, um, but it's still kind of sweet. And that's the problem you run into uh, if you are using one of those really low alcohol yeasts. And so that then you end up having to produce a wort that uh, won't have much maltose, which is tricky to do because that's sort of what the primary enzymes in uh, malt will do. You might have to end up adding, um, oh, the enzyme that uh, produces alpha, no, it's not alpha glucosidase. It's, I forget, there's, there's one that will break down maltose into glucose to, to allow it to be um, fermented. It's the same one that folks add to uh, brewed IPAs, um, glu glucose something, glucose something. Um, I know, uh, I think omega yeast produces a yeast that produces that enzyme on its own, but then obviously you're going to end up with alcohol. Um, and so that's, that's sort of, again, it's the balance. And, and it's certainly some of these uh, yeast strains that are uh, marketed for making uh, low alcohol or no al alcohol beers can be valuable, but um, there sometimes are uh, constraints on the work that, that works with them. Um, if they can only do uh, five or 6% attenuation, um, you really can't start with enough malt and enough of these compounds. Although, and one of the things I've wanted to try is combining that cold mashing technique with one of those low alcohol strands as a way to get in as much of the um, flavor compounds as I can, but then not produce any alcohol. Um, and I think it's the kind of thing that might be able to work and say like a stout or something where you've got like the roast and the malt and, and a little bit more character than say a, a hoppy beer. Great question. Uh, Peter, as our next question, lager question, how do you increase clarity? I usually have the keg sitting in the kegerator on location for several days, but the kegerator has to be wheeled out before serving of the event. A floating dip tube has helped, but I'm looking for crystal clear clarity, not a unfiltered lager clarity. Yeah. Um, You've got a couple options. I mean, obviously, the classic option is filter. Um, I do not like filtering. It's a pain. Uh, it is risky. You can introduce oxygen if you don't do it perfectly. Um, we we can't step mash, so that's you know out of the question for like a protein rest or something like that. But we do two things. We do uh, the Clarex, um, which really uh, helps with that um, chill haze, with that sort of permanent haze. And then the other thing we do is biofine. Um, so we do about a liter of biofine per 10 barrels. Um, and we do that, you know, we get the beer as clear as we can. We drop out yeast. We um, get it, you know, as much as of that stuff as we can out. Um, in an ideal world, you would be transferring to a bright tank. If you use a bright tank and you would have a keg or something else hooked up in line where you could be slowly pushing in that biofine that was mixing with the beer as it was going in. Um, I actually kind of like, uh, that gets better mixing. Uh, the problem is that then you can have a bunch of junk settling out in your bright tank if you don't have a little arm or some way to pull off above where that uh, yeast is. You're just going to be kegging or canning and probably having some of that leaking in. Um, Biofine can also be really helpful because it uh, will help the yeast. Even if it does end up in there, it will stick a little bit better. And so even if you have to move it into position, um, it shouldn't get stirred up nearly as much. You could look at more uh, flocculent yeast strains. Um, the, again, you know, there are a lot of lager strains and the flavor differences are pretty subtle. And so looking for a yeast strain that was, because um, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like you're having yeast getting stirred up. Um, if it was chill haze, that's not something that would be affected by uh, moving the keg around or something like that. Either you have chill haze or you don't. Um, looking for like a more, tenu a more flocculent yeast strain could help. Um, adding biofine, upping the biofine rate if you're not adding enough, making sure that biofine is really mixed in well um, so that it's effective. And then just, I mean, lagering is about time and making sure you're getting the beer as cold as possible and holding it there for, um, you know, I would say two weeks at a minimum. Um, there are a lot of places that, you know, brag about six weeks or eight weeks of lagering. I generally don't find that that improves the beer that much. And in fact, I really, I, I like a fresh, bright, multi flavor. And I think if you do your fermentation right and you get rid of the diacetyl and you um, 
we crash relatively slowly. We'll do five degrees a day or five degrees every 12 hours, depending on what sort of rush we're in. Um, that reduces the amount of esters that the yeast will sort of release because it's being stressed by cooling. Um, all those things work. Um, often that first pour, there is a little bit of yeast or something like that, but um, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, un unnaturally uh, ugly or something like that. And the old trick is if you if you don't like it, just get some stone stoneware mugs or something and no one will be able to see how clear it is or isn't. <laughs> and look macho with the stoneware mugs. I'm sorry, say it again? I said look macho with the uh, stoneware mugs. <laughs> All right, and our last question uh, comes from Eduardo. Uh, do you need conversion to extract unfermentable sugars? I thought for low ABV, you want to minimize the conversion to reduce the amount of fermentables. How would sapwood sellers go about making a zero or half percent percent beer? Good question, Eduardo. So le legally, we can't make a zero percent beer in America. Um, that becomes an FDA thing. So legally as a brewery, without a food license or something like that, we need to have half percent alcohol. At half percent alcohol, it's legally beer, uh, and the FDA chooses not to regulate it technically. Um, the only beers we've done that with have been with um, these low alcohol yeast strains. So again, the CHR, Hansen, Near, Smart Bev system, whatever it was. Um, and in that case, uh, we've done it a couple of times. The first one, um, we leaned into fruit. So we did a mango vanilla thing. And so I think that's one option is, you know, you make a smoothie sour, you're not tasting beer, you're tasting um, fruit, you're tasting vanilla, you're tasting other, other sort of um, adjuncty flavors. Um, that's sort of easy because that's just, you know, you don't have to taste malt. You don't need a lot of malt. And so in that case, we just used very dilute wort, fermented it to, you know, 1% alcohol and then, you know, mixed it or whatever it was, it was like one part, one part fruit to two parts uh, beer. So yeah, like 1% close, cut, to, cut it close in half with um, mango puree. Um, the other one we did, uh, we really love uh, Rewaka hops, New Zealand. Um, they're just so dank and diesel and whatever. And so Scott just took one of our pale ale bases, watered it down a little bit to get the gravity down. Uh, and then we fermented it with this um, smart bev. Um, and that it wants to flocculate out since it's not producing CO2 because CO2 is a um, byproduct of fermentation. Um, you actually have to uh, have it hooked up with a pump and keep it recirculating to keep it in suspension so it keeps fermenting. Um, and that's really necessary uh, to, to uh, get that um, wordy flavor. You know, you need it to reduce the gravity um, five or six points, I think is all, about all it did. Um, and then dry hopped with Ruaka and it, uh, it was pretty good. It like, is it, does it taste as good as Bell's lighthearted? Maybe almost, you know, again, it's, it's just hard where, you know, alcohol has flavor and texture and, um, all those things just, you don't have that, but if you have a punchy enough hop or you have um, something else to look at that, that can really uh, help. Well, that is all of our questions. Uh, Viola has corrected herself. She says, according to the German Wikipedia, Goza stopped being brewed in Leipzig in 1966 until it was taken up again in 1986. So anyway, hopefully we'll see her in the uh, Zoom call, although it is awfully late. <laughs> was it nine now? What is it, 3 a.m.? Gosh, I hope she's not up that late. Time to wake up. Uh, and Ray has a black screen, but uh, Ray, we're we're about to switch over to Zoom. Michael, can you join us? Uh, will that will that work out? I'd, I'd I'd be happy to. Is there was the link in? Did you email it to me or what was the? Uh, it should have been in the emails. I put it in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you can copy and paste that out of the chat. It's a Bitly link. Gourmet. I'm, I'm sure I'll hangout. be able to find it. Yeah. Do you see it there in the chat? After party on Zoom, got it. Yeah, and just click on that. Uh, might need a moment uh, uh, as I grab another beer. 
But, uh, you know, for those that are not going to come into Zoom, uh, first of all, Michael, I want to tell you how much I appreciated this. This was fantastic. We tried to do something in the spring, and I had complications uh, from a trip to South Africa that prevented me from uh, making it happen. But I appreciate you rescheduled. This was fantastic. Had a lot of good input from my YouTube channel. And again, I would encourage folks to uh, join that if you can. Uh, so we'll move on to the Zoom party. I'm going to grab another beer and we'll see you in the Zoom in a minute. Excellent. Thanks for, thanks for all the questions, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. I, I always love an excuse to talk beer and uh, drink some beer I wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and thanks again to Doug for uh, having, having me on here even uh, after uh, we'd met in person probably six or seven years ago at uh, yes. Asheville, BrewCon, something, something. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Good memory. Well, as we wrap up, let's switch to Zoom. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. See you in the Zoom.